Hello there, and welcome back to The Rich Fritzky Show. It's been a while, and I'm sorry for being late this week. Appreciate all you listeners, all you who stay with me, and anyone new who joins me for that matter. Thank you. My plan this week is to take a long leap back in time, back into the heart of childhood innocence, which I will. But first, given my sad preoccupation with the lunatic housed in our White House, a word of thanks to the United States Supreme Court for making it a bad week for him, as they issued two decisions rightfully that cut off and crippled mean and spiteful plans i.e. his long-standing attempt to kill the DACA program for the Dreamers and his abominable wish that gay, transgender, and all in the LBGTQ community be denied the protections of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Well, the court said that they are indeed protected and that the Dreamers, children of illegals born in the United States, remain protected by DACA. And then delightfully, as to his Tulsa rally and its mean-spirited affront to the Black Lives Matter movement, his campaign boasted that a million people wanted in, but they had only 19,000 seats in the arena. Well, a million turned out to be no more than 6,000. And oh, the rage that his campaign staff must have had to endure. Then, too, there is the continued attention that must be paid to the rising of Black Lives Matter, social justice, and the hopeful demise of racist and criminal policing. To anyone who responded to appeals for simple justice and change with Blue Lives Matter or I Support the Long Blue Line and her shock or outrage at the protests with the Why Are the Demonstrators Always Slash Rioters and Looters ignoring the social distancing concerns. Please, please, please stop and do a deep and soulful dive within. It is the crucible of the long struggle, of a so very long struggle with life and death. It is the fierce urgency of now. They did not choose this moment, this time. The palpably racist cops who murdered George Floyd ushered in the this far no further of it all. To that brutal act captured on video that demands all good people, all human beings with souls to please, please open up their eyes and their hearts to the 350 years of unrequited suffering and oppressive racism that drives the all of this. And to all those hamlets and towns in white America painting those blue lines down their streets in support of police everywhere. You are, at this time and in this way, actually and rather demonstrating your support for the murderer who just choked George Floyd to death. And those many cops who recently shot black boys in the back for venial and not mortal sins of he who pumped those four bullets into the chest of a man for the sin of reaching for his license and registration as he was instructed to do, of the lunatic who dragged Sandra Bland out of her car for the temerity of smoking a cigarette, of the tens of thousands of brutal beatings over the years and the hundreds of deaths at the hands of white racist cops who had but the power and the badge, while deserving neither. You are, my friends, in not drawing a distinction between the good and the racist, not supporting the police. You are supporting police who have used their badges as instruments of extreme and intolerable hate. So I am filled up with so many jumbled up thoughts today. I hear the Reverend William Sloan Coffins. I believe that God cries first. And Matthew's Jesus wept. I hear a young Abe Lincoln and his wonderful Here Lies Johnny Congapod. Have mercy on him, gracious God, as he would do if he were God and you were Johnny Congapod. I believe today that there are only two paths forward for Americans. It's either despair or activism. So I, as ever, hear Bobby, some men see things as they are and ask why. I dream things that never were and say why not. And I hear the telling words of that somber song 
from South Pacific. You've got to be taught to hate and fear. You've got to be taught from ear to ear. Yes, you've got to be carefully taught. That was in 1949, 71 years ago. And yet the war fought from 1861 through 1865, the one to save Lincoln's last best hope of earth, or what was represented a democracy, and to free the slaves and to eliminate the scourge of slavery, goes on. For after a hundred years of the vileness of Jim Crow and the blip of hope with Brown v. Topeka, the Little Rock Nine, Malcolm Martin, and then another 50 years of standing still until now, until this movement, this day, and the millions upon millions of voices who will no longer tolerate those in blue who act like slave masters this far, no further. And now, believe it or not, I'm going to take that quantum leap to the innocence of childhood. We didn't see anything special about our neighborhood as kids, and yet we were blessed. We were two blocks away from Packard's, a store that will warrant its own exploration, and where all we Fritzky boys worked. And we were less than a half block from the Fairmount School playground and its summers of arts and crafts, kickball and stickball and but a block away from Baldwin Park and its baseball diamond and basketball courts, where I would come to live later. But the fields that were closest to the heart were those fashioned right in our own backyard and on the street in front of our 138 Poplar Avenue home. For a long time, it was wiffle ball and stoop ball above all else. Playing first demanded that attention be paid to our neighbors who would most certainly be impacted and to our dad who would not tolerate our doing any damage. So we children established codes of conduct and unique and uncontestable rules of play. Just a quick word about stoop ball first, which could be played one-on-one, -on -one, but with as many as four-on-four. -four. The only equipment required was a firm 12 to 15 cent Spalding ball, nothing more. And of course, cement steps off the sidewalk that would, in our case, get you to the front lawn and then onto the wooden steps that would take you to the front door. For us, it was three cement steps with three ridge lines. That's where the height of the one step gives way to the base of the next. In stoop ball, the pitcher was the batter who would from mid-street fire the Spalding into the steps, ever aiming for that ridge line, one of those three ridge lines, which would give way to crisp line drives or towering homers lofted over the homes across the street. It required precision and skill, for just missing the ridge line would give way to dribblers and easy outs. Some would play it safe by aiming for the ever larger step walls that could never produce a homer, but could get you a base hit, even a double, or an out. As to retrieving home runs, the Ronfelts had no problem with us, nor the McDonald's, but the elder lady in the house directly across from us sure did. So stealth and speed were required in order to recover the Spalding. The trees in their branches, by the way, could kill you, as certain homers could be turned into singles and even outs by them. Traffic was minimal, and we, of course, paused for vehicles. All I have time to tell you about Stoop Bull is that it was, in memory, mystical and magical. For when you were up and the Spaulding was in your throwing hand, that little Spaulding, there was this belonging to that little ball and the raw power in it that you alone could generate. No baseball or wiffle ball or any other kind of ball ever flew as majestically and fast as a Spalding. The ball was worthy of your best, and as such, I never played it safe. I went for the ridge line every time, no matter how many times I was embarrassed by the near misses and the easy outs. Now, to understand our wiffle ball rules, it first requires getting the lay of the land in our backyard and knowing a bit about the two neighbors across from us and the neighbor right behind us on Fairmount Avenue. Our backyard had four quadrants, 
I want you to try and view them from the back door. The first to the right, easy, it was consumed by a garage. The first to the left was framed by flower beds and clothing lines. The two more distant quadrants were both framed by the wall of tomato plants that fronted a tall wooden and spike fence in the rear that separated our backyard from that of Mr. and Mrs. Fisk. Their garage was immediately behind the right side of that fence, and there was a rare above-ground pool in our neighborhood on the left side. You pitch from the back of the garage into a home plate that was as close as possible to the tomato plants in the back right quadrant. There was no running the bases, just a pitcher and a batter, more often one-on-one, -on -one, but in the extreme, as many as three-on-three. -three. Every part of the yard and the garage and driveway and the surrounding neighborhood impacted rules. In that final quadrant to the left and rear, well, there was a huge, beautiful lilac bush, other assorted bushes, and one big old gooseberry bush smack dab in the center of it all. Anything to the gooseberries garage side was fair and in play. Anything beyond the gooseberries was foul. Now placing yourself in the batter's box, the fist spiked wooden fence was right behind you, and to your right there was a chess level high chain link fence in the distance separating our yard from that of the Kastners. A couple with two children, a girl and a boy, a bit younger than I, who kept to themselves, kind of an island unto themselves. I felt sorry for them, as they had a dad who didn't do anything but yell and terrorize. There was no Bowman Park or playground for them. Some dads, sure as hell, just don't deserve the privilege of being one. To the immediate left of the batter was sweet old Mrs. Berry's yard which was not fenced off at all, but which had a gorgeous garden with a fish pond to boot. While there was no fence or barrier, we were, of course, forbidden to traipse through that garden, or what was a virtual arboretum. A retired teacher, we all bonded over the years with Mrs. Berry, as her mom offered us up to her to tackle all hard labor, from snow shoveling to raking the leaves to mowing, etc., her stamp collection and coin collections were to die for. But wait for it, her button collections were more marvelous still. Can you imagine that? A champion, she attended the National Association of Button Collectors Annual Convention, and she was a celebrated hero there. I assure you, by the way, there wasn't any epic story in our history that she couldn't tell in buttons. Here are the basic rules of the game. Anything past the pitcher on the ground was a single. A line drive or pop-up beyond the pitcher and off the cement of the garage was a double. A triple had to hit the wood diamond atop the garage, and anything off the roof was a homer. Should it carry all the way over the garage and fare and land on the driveway, well, that was an automatic grand slam. And so, too, was hitting it off the six-inch ridge line atop the garage. As to the three neighbors, into Mrs. Berry's yard was just an automatic out. As you could stealthily run in, watch out for the flowers in her, and retrieve. Into the Kastner's yard was an automatic sides retired. For while climbing the fence was easy, it took stealth and speed to run and retrieve without being seen. And should Mr. Kastner be in the yard and policing, you could kiss that ball goodbye. Into the fist yard behind us landed the harshest of all penalties, an automatic game loss. Now if it was popped straight back, landed between the fence and their garage, it was, despite the height and the pointed edges, an easy return. But into the pool was nigh on impossible by day, and usually required a late night's swim. We took the fist as unfriendly back then, but Mrs. Fist would later and tragically die in a hit and run while crossing Prospect Avenue with a bag of groceries from Packard's in her arms. All the vagaries of life and death. It made us all feel real bad for Mr. Fisk, and later upon my return from Boston, 
and race for the New Jersey legislature. Old Mr. Fiss was my most involved and caring of volunteers. He would daily walk from his house to our Main Street headquarters. I grew to love the man who we once and for long, in our wiffle ball days, terribly misjudged. Hell, he would have simply tossed the balls back for us, if we had only asked. From morning to nightfall, come rain or shine, the wiffle ball, with its unpredictable dips and climbs and sudden curves, was ever in the air. Batting, I lived in my imagination, and I was either Bobby Richardson or Yogi Berra. Oh, yes, I would have been Maris or Mickey, but Roger was a southpaw swinger and Mickey a switch hitter, and I but a pure righty. As wistful as all of this was, one had to respect the realities. We also applied a nine-year-old standard to the game. So if you were eight, you got four strikes. And if seven, you got five to six strikes. And if ten or above, only two strikes. Fairness and balance counted. And if you lost a ball to Mr. Kastner or to the Fisk Yard, you were obligated to replace it. But the guys who had the paper routes invariably covered for the youngsters. All my brothers, Frank, Bobby, Jack, and Bill, played. And neighbors like the Montesanos, who also had five boys, and the bed Nashes and mustos, and the occasional strays. In a good season, you can rack up more than 300 wins. That's 200 more than the best of the major leaguers. No other backyard competed with ours, because our rules of play were just so damn unusual we had considered the interrelatedness of things and engineered a unique structure. Our rules were fair, reasoned, understandable, interesting. And unlike our America today, the richer covered for the poorer and those less likely to have the power or the wherewithal to succeed were given unique opportunities to do better and to sustain and so succeed in time. Unlike America, in our 138 Poplar Avenue backyard, no one ever demeaned or laughed at the lesser players. You cheered for them. You stopped the game to teach them. You did everything you could to make them better. Scowling, belittling, and laughing at another could get you banned. Do it three times and you lost the privilege to play on the best damn wiffle ball field in the land. We were young, we were Yankees, we were dreamers, and we played for the love of the game. That's it for now, folks. Always good to have you with me. Thank you so very much. Pray you have a great weekend, and I'm going to try and be back to you early next week. Take care. Bye now.